Hello, uh, welcome to the presentation about the MicroPython gotchas. So it, it, it won't be necessarily about the MicroPython itself, but about my journey through MicroPython. And uh, who am I? Uh, well, I'm a serious software engineer working for a big company, but here I'm privately. So uh, if you have the urge to contact me, you can um, email me, you can try to follow me on Twitter, I do not tweet, tweet too much. You cannot find me on Facebook. Uh, if you don't jot down my email address, I made sure that you will see my email address on each and every slide. So whenever you need, just take a picture, that's it. So yeah, I mentioned that I'm, uh, that I'm working for a big company. Yes, I work as a software engineer for Harman, and so usually I'm working on uh, some embedded systems. That's probably why I'm taking uh, making a presentation about MicroPython. Uh, when I'm not working for Harman, I work for a co Polish company called Sages, which is the training company, so I deliver training sessions about Python around my country, which is Poland. And, well, my professional life usually evolves or is based around the C, Python, and Linux, and that's it. So, let me tell you a story, because this presentation has nothing to do with my professional life. So some time ago, uh, me and a couple of my friends, we took part in the hackathon, which was called Hackie, which was probably the biggest hackathon in Europe. It was held in Prague, in Poland. And we had just one purpose. The sole purpose of our taking part in it was, was hacking. So what the hacking is? Well, the Wikipedia says that it is the act of engaging in activities such as programming or other media in a spirit of playfulness and exploration. This is all about this presentation. It will be about the playfulness and exploration. And during this hackathon, there was one idea that was coming all and all, over and over again to us. And it was that, well, there are so many cases in which you could use a thermal printer. There was one guy who created the project who that printed these uh, tweets on the thermal printer, and we had plenty of opportunities of thinking in different cases. So, after this hackathon, after having a few liquid refreshments, it occurred that actually every project is better when it has a thermal printer. And uh, two of us got this topic a bit further. And we bought the thermal printer. Yeah, this one. And there it came. It was, it was rather small. You could just power it with any regular power supply that you have at your home. It communicates over Europe. So each and every typical serial communication should do. And there is a Python library for it. So it makes it not only nice, but it also makes it pleasure for programming. So let's Python it. Well, Adafruit created a library that deals pretty well with this printer. So I just downloaded the library. It's almost pure Python. It somehow uh, depends on the, on the PySerial module and the Python imaging library. And it works mainly out of the box. So, I decided to run it on Raspberry Pi, and it, and it ran. Actually, this is a test page from this very printer. You can see the Raspberry Pi running here, but it wasn't enough. We were thinking about how this could be made. Oh, this is the sound of the printer. Uh, how we can run it on something smaller. Because, you know, Raspberry Pi is, is it's almost like a C. It's, it's a powerful computer. And a friend of mine, the owner of the second thermal printer, he ported this library to MicroPython. And it is also available on GitHub. And uh, he used another word, which is called LowPy. And LowPy is created by PyCom. And this is meant to develop solutions for the long-range, uh, wide area networks, uh, for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, but apart from that, it, con it has a regular microcontroller with all the peripherals, so, well, you can use it to actually control the thermal printer. So he, pr he ported the library and it worked. He made a few changes. So at first he removed the 
Python 2 code, because MicroPython is, is Python 3 compatible language, well, a few others, he replaces the PySerial with the machine neural, because MicroPython has a built-in machine module that has the functions to, con to control the hardware, and you are this part of the hardware. So we have the serial communication out of the box. And we removed, or he removed, the Python Imagic library dependencies because it's not really good for MicroPython due to resource constraints. OK, so everything worked. So let's have a deeper look in the hardware. Let's have a, have a, different, a deeper look into the hardware that we were running. So this low pi bar, this is the small part. The big one is just an extension bar, so it's easier, easier to connect. So it runs some kind of an ESP32 microcontroller, which is a pretty powerful one. It has a UART, so it's sufficient to control the thermal printer. It has half a megabyte of RAM, which is not bad for a microcontroller. It has four megabytes of flash for your programs, so you can store your data, your programs, bitmaps you want to, uh, to print. Sounds pretty good. Well, and it runs MicroPython out of the box. So the firmware that's there, it, it has MicroPython implemented. It costs about $35, which is not that cheap. So it ran on this board, but I thought that I would run it on something smaller. And I came up with this. All right. So this one is ESP12E. You can get it. Uh, you can get it online. And this is a, a bit different microcontroller, which is pretty popular for MicroPython. This is the ESP8066. It has the UART, so we can control the printer. There is a firmware that's based on MicroPython, and it's all about $2, just, which, which, is, which is actually the price I was looking for. It has four megabytes of flash, so the same as the bigger board, but it has just 36 kilobytes of RAM. What is more, if you load MicroPython on it, you will be left with like 24, maybe 25 kilobytes. So what I did, I just took the library. The web app is, is the tool to upload it on the board. So I took the library, uploaded it on the board, imported the library to see if I can print anything, and not. Not really. Well, this is probably the first time in my life when I've seen the memory error from Python. <laughs> so it occurred that, well, it's not necessarily connected with the size of the library itself. But when you're working with memory constrained systems, such, such as embedded systems, you need to be aware that after importing, the module needs to be compiled to the bytecode. And this is fact number one. Bytecode compilation needs RAM. So what you can do about it? Well, you probably haven't done it with the regular Python, but you can pre-compile it on PC. Let's talk about the cross-compiler. Well, the cross-compilation is, is one of the things that is really common when it comes to embedded systems. So you compile it on the PC and you run it on other hardware. So you are actually creating the byte code, or the executable code, the machine code, that will be working on a different architecture than the computer that's used for the compilation. So where you can get the, comp the cross-compiler from MicroPython? Well, it comes with the MicroPython Python itself. So what do you actually need to do to, to use it? Well, you need to get the MicroPython sources, compile the cross-compiler, and then compile your MicroPython module to the byte code, and it should work. It's not that bad. So you can get MicroPython from GitHub. You can uh, go to the MPy cross, which is the cross compiler directory. Just run make. If you have a GNU toolchain or Clang or uh, on your computer, it should work out of the box. And you can try if the MPy cross actually is running. Well, it is. That's it. It's good. So I cross compiled the module. I uploaded it on the board. Let's see, I'm not uploading it as a thermal pi, but mpy. mpy is, is the MicroPython's bytecode file. And we tried to import. So 
This time it worked. So it was just enough to pre-compile the sources. So let's print something. So we know that it already worked on low pi. So what's about what's printing all about? Starting from the very bottom. So you need to configure your then you need to send the data over here so you can actually print something. The machine module that contains the hardware related functions is already in MicroPython. It has the UART class, and the UART class has all the, all the tools for using the serial communication. And the thermal printer li library is already using the UART class. And it looks like that. So it tries to con construct the UART object. Well, you need to pass the baud rate, the pins that you're going to use for your, how many stop bits, all the regular your configuration. And it didn't work. It worked perfectly on low pi. It didn't work at all on the ESP. Why? Because it occurs that there are too many extra keyword arguments given to the, to the class constructor. What has happened? Well, it doesn't work because the machine yard implementation of ESP8266 doesn't support pins parameter. It, it, the API is not compatible between those two MicroPython implementations. So yeah, we need to face fact number two. Hardware related functions may have different APIs for different hardware platforms, even if they have the same name. So what now? Well, never assume that the code will work on different hardware without testing it on this hardware. Make sure that you have uh, s tested your solution on the hardware you care to work on. After some changes, well, I just removed this pins parameter from the constructor. I checked if it is there. I'm trying to pass it to the constructor with the extra options. If it is not, we won't pass it. And now it works on both boards. So, and it worked. I finally could have seen something, but it's, there is something different. Have you, if you remember the, the, when it was printing on the Raspberry Pi, this one, well, it's, 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 it has a certain drawback. Yeah. <laughs> it's extremely slow. And, but if, if you can see that, it's, it's rather printing a line and it's waiting for some time and printing another line, so probably some, something with the time measurement. So there are two suspicious functions. There is some kind, in, the, in this library, I found something that's been used like a timer. Well, it's used not to overflow the buffer, the internal buffer of the printer. So how is it set? So we set some point in time so we take the current time, we add x, which is some fraction of, of a second. And then we use another function to check if this time has passed. If it has passed, we can continue. If it hasn't passed, we cannot continue. It is how it is used. So we set the, if we try to write some bytes, we set it to wait. And then we set it to certain amount of time. So whenever we re-enter this function, it won't send any bytes unless certain time passes. so we are sure that the buffer in the, in the printer won't overflow. This single byte time is about, well, a bit more than one millisecond. So you can imagine we are working on rather small amounts of time. So what was the problem? If you look at the manual, you will see that the time function returns seconds and it is an integer, not like in C Python whether it is a float. So the accuracy is actually one second. So if I wanted to wait for a couple of milliseconds, I ended up waiting at least a second. So yeah, it's time to speed it up. But the manual says that there are different functions that gives you the millisecond and microsecond Precision. So we should probably not use the time function, use the micro or millisecond resolution. It operates on integer, but these integers have different meaning. So, yeah, it's time to face the fact three. 
functions that look familiar to C Python equivalents may behave differently. Read the manual. <laughs> Make sure you use the appropriate APIs for your needs. So we may use the takes my milliseconds. So with an arbitrary reference point that drops around at some value. So we cannot it's not it's not continuous. The values may wrap around from time to time. So we need to use the special methods, which is text div and text add, instead of a regular operators, which were plus, minus, and all the others, just to make sure that we won't hurt ourselves. So it sounds easy. We should change our functions and use the micro, uh, the micro time text add to add the specific period of time in milliseconds. Then you can use the text div to check if we actually passed the border of, of, or if, if, we, if the time has passed. So should we wait or not? So this, is, this sounds OK. So I ran it, and it worked perfectly on ESP. It doesn't run on Wallpy. It occurs that there is no ticks add in Lopi's micro Python. We need to f face fact number four. Even standard micro Python modules, such as MicroTime, may not implement all the functions. <laughs> Read the manual. <laughs> and test it on the target hardware. <laughs> Write a wrapper. It might be a solution. So, I came up with a poor man's solution for that. So if we have the ticks diff method, we use it. If not, we will just use the regular minus or plus operators. There's, this is far from being perfect, but it will work in most of the cases. So after these changes, it worked. And now it works with, with, with a better speed. So we're done. After all these changes, I could have wrapped them in nice pull request, sent it to the library author, it got integrated, it is on GitHub, and that would have been an end of my presentation, but there is a bonus. Just a couple days ago, I figured out that there is not every, that not everything is okay with the ticks diff function. And this is how it works. Well, this is, this is some period, moment in time, in, in milliseconds. And this is a bit later, like two milliseconds later. And ticks diff on low pi, if you put it in this order, will give you two milliseconds in this, minus two milliseconds, which is pretty obvious. It just subtracts one from another. But if you run it on ESP, <laughs> That, yeah, that's it. It takes the same arguments, but the order is different. So, uh, I do not have a solution yet for that. But if you see, the low pi documentation clearly says the old value should actually precede new value in time. Our result is undefined. But the ESPs, documentation for MicroPython, the argument order is the same as for subtraction. So the bigger one should be first. <laughs> and this is how it is implemented. So we need to face fact number five. Even if the API is the same, functions may behave differently. <laughs> well, we can write a wrapper that will detect the unusual behavior and try to react to it. I'm working on a solution. It might be ready in a couple of days. And we need to test it on as many boards as possible. So this is time for summing up. So I show you a few cases where the MicroPython worked a bit differently, differently than I suppose it to. So you need to, when you're starting with MicroPython, you need to remember first thing. MicroPython is not the Python you're accustomed to. It's not like CPython. 
it's, it's more of a language that has a Python syntax. It doesn't include all the nice libraries that you have in a C Python standard library. And you need to be, sh to be aware that it is still kind of a work in progress. And what you have seen, the implementations for different hardware are different. And it's not only about the hardware features provided by different boards. It's, always, it's also about the modules that we think that are part of the standard library. They may not be complete, or the functions, although they look the same, they may behave differently. And uh, coming back to, to the first slides, you need to be aware that embedded devices' resources are rather constrained. So it's in terms of the processing power of the CPU, it's about the memory. So you can use the strategies like the one I, I, uh, I demonstrated you to pre-compile the modules and then load them on the boards, or if it doesn't help, it's still possible to compile and freeze your module into the firmware and flash it together with the firmware just to avoid gaps in RAM. This one was not shown there, but it is also a possibility. Well, you should never trust your gut feeling and read the documentation instead. If I have read the documentation before applying the changes, I could have probably avoided some of them. Or maybe it was quicker to just implement it and later fix the, the issues. At least it ended up in the presentation. And you need to test your code on as many devices as possible because there are no such things as, uh, as emulators for, for these boards. So if you want to check if the, if the hardware features are actually working, you need to test it on the real hardware. There is a MicroPython port for Unix, but it is just one of the implementations and it doesn't include any hardware related stuff. So you need to test it on the board. So it brings the next and the last point. Sh just share your code. Let the others test it on their hardware. This is what happened to us. A friend of mine created the low pies port. Then I ran it on the ESP board and it occurred that there are quite a few things that are not compatible with, between those ones. So publish your code. Let the others do the job. And that's basically all I wanted to tell you. And, well, I started my presentation with a quote, so it would be nice to end it with another quote. So I found this one. So, thank you. That was, that was my presentation. Uh, in case there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them right now. Yeah, sure. So, uh Not yet, but I'm planning, after these experiences, I'm planning to create some kind of a test harness for the, for the hardware, or the MicroPython based hardware. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah it, it, it seems like an obvious solution. Yeah. It wasn't the feature on Hackaday. No, no, maybe it was something different. I, I do not have a blog on Hackaday. Yeah. So, if there are no more questions, oh, there is a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no idea if the specification actually actually exists. Exactly. So can we do something about it? Because it's quite not a micro micro. Can we do something about the specification? Do we can then we done something about it? Well in my opinion, 
that, that there sh should be some kind of maybe not an organization but some maybe maybe a person who will start up the movement I, I don't know and maybe a central committee yeah My, Thank you.